Good morning, friends. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us in person today and those of you who are gathering with us online. We are so glad each and every one of you is here. This past Thursday, in an effort to keep up with the conditions as, um, as we are experiencing them here in Kittery, the, um, on the recommendation of the safety team, the council voted to um, allow for the removal of masks once people are seated in their pews. Um, when you um, sing, we do invite you to return the masks um, so that it will be extra difficult to read the words in the hymnal. Um, but uh, today's hymns, we, we know the words mostly by heart, so um, that hopefully that works for you today. Uh, we will continue to try to keep up with, with the conditions and, um, and recommend other, other um, precautions as, as the needs see fit. We will be having some hospitality time downstairs in the vestry following worship. Um, and we do invite you to come down for a cup of coffee and some goodies, and we thank Melissa for putting all of that together. Are there other announcements to share this morning? We will be inviting you to come forward uh, during the uh, time of prayer to light a candle if you would like for, uh, to remember somebody who has died and that you would like to have remembered here um, with a candle burning uh, before all of us. So we invite you to give that some thought when you do come forward. Again, please mask up and um, try to um, stay somewhat distant from one another. We will keep in our prayers the first responders who are um, running their sirens right now and those whose needs they are attending to. Let us continue in our worship. The call to community is printed in our bulletins. Let us read responsively. Hear, O people of God. Our God is one. Hear the commandments of our God. First, love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Hear, O people of God. Our God is one. Recite the commandments to your children and hold them in your hearts. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these calls to love. Our opening hymn is number 65, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Let us pray our gathering prayer. O Holy One, source of all life and ground of all love, we thank you for your love that never lets us go. Thank you for the privilege of gathering in this space and beyond with these your people, our neighbors, to worship you. We do not come merely to open the doors of the church. We come that our hearts might be opened to you and to one another. As we gather for worship today, help us to respond to the call of love, to love you, to love our neighbors, to love ourselves. Guide us as individuals, as families, as a community of faith, and as a wider world to be transformed and emboldened to follow you on the path of love. Amen. First scripture lesson. We're going to have some music first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to let myself get up here.
Our first scripture lesson this morning is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. Let us listen for the word of God. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let us listen also for the word of God as it comes to us in the book of the Revelation to John in the 21st chapter. You may recognize these uh, scripture verses. They are the assigned readings for All Saints Sunday, but they often um, also appear in our um, funeral liturgies and memorial services uh, where we talk about this great feast that God is preparing for us um, and, and this, this new heaven and new earth that God is creating for us. So let us listen again for the word of God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Here ends the reading of the lessons. May God bless our reading, hearing, and understanding of these words. Early last summer, before the real estate prices really began to soar, our son and daughter-in-law were able to cobble together enough money to put down a down payment on a home in Wilmington, North Carolina. We would have rather it had been in Kittery, Maine or elsewhere, but that's where they landed. It's a lovely little house, the, but the previous owners had done precious little in the area of landscaping. However, in the middle of the backyard, and it probably pre-exists the house, is a gnarly, gorgeous, old, 
eastern red cedar. It must be 40 feet tall. It's huge. Branches just twisting and turning. This has been there for a while. And behind that, which you can't really see from the house, is a big, lovely pecan tree. Last fall, Andrew let us know that he collected a bumper crop of pecans. There were nuts all over the yard. Their dogs keep the squirrels at bay so that they were able to collect, I think he said it was almost a five gallon bucket of pecans from this single tree. He shelled them, he roasted them, he gave them away to his friends, and we got nothing. <laughs> Someone flipped this house. That's the thing nowadays, right? So they, they bought this house, they did some uh, upgrades inside, they removed the ramp from the front, they dressed it up a little bit, and by dressed it up a little bit, they planted like six or eight one-gallon azaleas along the front of the house. And azaleas are fine for like two weeks a year. Uh, other than that, it's, it's just green, right? I, don't get me wrong, I like azaleas, they're fine. <laughs> but that was the landscaping. And it gave a little bit of curb appeal. But when Linda and I went down there in April, the blooms were all fading. They were brown. They really didn't look that great. So I suggested to Andrew a few things that we could do to kind of dress things up a little bit. And so we went to the local nursery. And we came back with a trunk full of plants and flowers. And we started digging. We moved the azaleas around to another spot. We kind of grouped them together so that they would be a nice display when they, when they come into their own. And we planted some things that would provide some appeal longer term through the summer into the fall. Some grasses, some black-eyed Susans, a hydrangea. And when we left, it looked nice. It was a great start. But there was plenty of room for growth. And then something really weird happened. Andrew decided he liked gardening. He was never one to cut the grass, even when it was asked of him. He was never one to help rake the leaves, much less dig in the dirt. Andrew was sort of an inside person. But Andrew started planting things all over the yard. He's now on a first-name basis with the people at the nursery. He's put in sunflowers and zinnias. He, he's putting in more grasses. He asked for a gift card to the nursery for his birthday. He began tending flower pots and started an herb garden. He would begin calling with questions about gardening when things weren't going well. He's now sending us twice weekly Marco Polo videos. Have you, anybody know about that app? There's a, it's, a, it's an app that you can kind of send short videos to groups of people. So, um, so he's sending us twice weekly. Here's what's going on in the yard. Here's what the dogs are doing. There's a squirrel that they're going to go get after. Marco Polo, it's fun. One of his emails, phone calls, whatever, was lamenting that the pecan tree didn't produce hardly anything this year. And he's wondering, is something wrong with it? Is there something that I did? It looks healthy, but where are the nuts? Last week, I started reading this book, Braiding Sweetgrass, by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And um, this, anybody familiar with this? Yeah, 
this is this is a good book. I'm I'm not far in, but um, this is a good book. Um, it's it's uh, the subtitle is Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. Raining sweetgrass. The author is a scientist, a botanist by trade. She's a professor and a Native American. And in one of the early chapters called The Council of Pecans, she answers the question, where are all the nuts? Now, I know there's a lot of funny things I could do um, with where are all the nuts, but I'm going to leave that for another time. It turns out and this may not come as a huge surprise to those of us who have um, oak trees on our properties. Last year, in our yard, the oak tree dropped so many acorns that it was like a sheet of ball bearings in our yard. We, you know, you don't usually have to rake up acorns, but last year we were raking up acorns. This year, there's hardly any. It turns out that nut trees specifically are on a boom and bust cycle. They don't always produce an abundance of nuts every year. And in this chapter, she explains why. You see, if trees just dropped an average amount of nuts each year, the squirrels and the chipmunks and the people would be very happy with that. They would collect all the nuts and there would be nothing left to be creating the next generation of trees. But on a boom year, on a boom year, they drop so many nuts that they overwhelm the whole ecosystem. And the squirrels and chipmunks and even the people can't collect all the nuts. Some are left on the ground to germinate. Some the squirrels will hide, dig a hole, plant them, and those will become the next generation of trees. Growing nuts, it turns out, takes a lot of energy. Unlike fruit trees, when they can produce apples, pears, peaches every year, nut trees need to save up. Now, I imagine that they've worked around this a little bit because there are commercial um, pecan trees, right? They're, they um, there's always pecans on the shelf at the store. Anyway, in their native environment, and uh, they grow wild in the plains of Kansas and Oklahoma, um, unlike that lone tree in Andrew and Camille's backyard, and I asked him, are there, are there other trees around you? He said, no. Pecan trees specifically thrive in groups. Pecan groves, they are called, and they range in size from dozens to scores of trees. How many of you thought you were going to get a botany lesson today? Okay, I'll get to my point. It turns out that they, um, even in, the, in a grove of trees, they don't rotate the boom and bust cycle. So a certain number of trees each year will have a boom cycle and everybody else will rest and then they, um, they jump in later on. Because that wouldn't be enough to overwhelm, to put down so many nuts that they can't all be collected. Somehow, the trees coordinate their boom and bust years. And scientists don't exactly know how. They think maybe it might be the, by the, through the pollen that's blowing through the air. Maybe there's some information in that. 
Others think more likely that it's, it's actually in the roots. There's microorganisms that, uh, uh, that, are, that are in and among the roots of the trees and they can um, spread out and communicate with one another that way. It's pretty cool stuff. Braiding sweetgrass, it's right in there. So they store up energy. They store up sugars and carbohydrates for a few years. And they even can share some between the different trees. So one tree that's, that's maybe near the, nearer to the stream can provide some nourishment to others who are further away. And then when they have stored up enough, they all decide this is the year. Let's overwhelm. And they drop their nuts. Some of you are saying, and I see it on your faces, that's all very interesting, Brad, but what's your point? What does this have to do with us? What wisdom do pecan trees have to share with us? Well, I am so very glad you asked. As you may know, today is All Hallows' Eve, Halloween, an ancient Druid holiday marking the end of summer and the beginning of a new year, a day on which they believe that the veil between heaven and earth Maybe those are our terms, but the afterlife and the present life, when that veil became particularly thin. And today in worship, we remember All Saints Day, and we name here those who have died this past year, and we light candles to remember those who have gone on before us, those who from generation to generation planted in our lives and here in this place the harvest that we reap today through those boom and bust years, sometimes overwhelming the community with our message of life and love, sometimes hunkering down, storing up energy and vision and money for the next thing. Today, we remember those who equipped this church for what will come next. On the table in front here is a little picture of Mildred Gary. For those of you who may not know, Mildred was the organist here. I think she came in 1944 on a temporary basis. And she was here for almost 50 years. Mildred was here for almost 50 years. How many of you remember Mildred? I know there's a few hands out there, yeah. Mildred, through those years, saved. She stored up her energy and her money. And when she died, she left this church a gift that enabled us to be the church that we are today. Without Mildred Gary, I don't know what, where this church would be right now. Today, Mildred's work is ours, yours and mine. It is true that all metaphors can become a bit wobbly. They may imagine on this All Saints Sunday that we are a grove. Safely distanced, but connected. Connected by the words we hear and say connected by the faith we share, 
connected by the beautiful music that fills this room, by the words of the hymns that we sing, firmly planted. Everybody, you ever, everybody have two feet down on the ground right now? Let's all put two feet down. Imagine our feet are rooted, firmly planted in the labors and memories of those who have come before us in this place. Imagine that flowing around to each person in this room. Imagine those with a little extra right now, sharing some with those who are hurting. Imagine us today working together to provide a welcoming place for those who will come after. Imagine that. Imagine that, oh, maybe five years ago in this very place, through our side-by-side -side campaign, we dropped enough nuts to overwhelm the community around us. Providing sustenance for the hungry, planting a few nuts here and there to assure that this place will be there for those who will come after us. Imagine us keeping our grove healthy and reminding everyone who walks by that we are still here caring for this community, caring for one another, still making a difference, welcoming and learning and going out into the world. Imagine us being a small but powerful grove of trees, providing shelter for the lost and sharing God's love with all. Imagine that. Imagine us preparing today, five years later, for another extravagant crop of nuts. Everybody relax, I'm not announcing another capital campaign. <laughs> but following up on what Paul Nickerson had to say to us last week, imagine what God has in store for us. Imagine that you have a vision here in your heart that you want to share with this community, with those of us in this place and those of us out in the world. Imagine. Imagine what's next. My friends, maybe this is the year. Maybe this is the year. Let's overwhelm again. Amen. During the prayer, we will name those who have died in this past year who are connected to this church in some way. Um, if, you, if you picked up a, a copy of the, uh, of the list, um, we, will, we will name those. If you did not get a list, please grab one on your way out. Um, if we get through the list, yes, Sharon. I, I can't. I can't hear you. Um, I, Edie Niles was on the list last year. Yeah, yeah. So the, um, the, the list there is for people who have died since last we named um, the list of people. Uh, we can come up and light a candle 
for, for all those others um, after, after our prayers. Uh, but uh, this list is specifically for those who have died in this past year. Are there other names uh, that we would like to lift up in prayer today? Judy? Sharon. Cindy. And uh, we'll keep um, Tammy in our prayers. And um, and Mike also. Let us pray. Eternal God, we who are your children lift our grateful thanks for our elder sisters and brothers in the household of faith for Abraham and Sarah, for Moses and Miriam, for Aaron and Joshua, for all those who led your people journeying into freedom and into a land promised to them, a land flowing with milk and honey. We give you thanks for the prophets to whom your word came for David, who sang your praises, for Miriam, who danced with holy joy and wild thanksgiving before your people. For Jesus, born of woman, who lived as a wandering preacher and healer among the simple and the great and who died abandoned among criminals. Whom you resurrected, who ascended in glory and who will come again among us. For the prophets and apostles and evangelists and missionaries who obediently followed you and carried the gospel to people of many lands. For the noble witnesses whose lives have spoken of your steadfast love and power and for those who face death for their obedience to your ways of justice in the world. Pray for those we name today who are in need of the comfort of your presence and healing touch. We pray for Judy, Sharon, Cindy, Tammy, and Mike. For those whose needs we left up to you now in silence. for those whose needs are known to you alone. For all the saints in every age who reflected your grace and truth in their lives, who stood fast in the faith and did the works of justice and of love. For Martin, for Teresa, for Nelson, for Mildred, for Carrie, and for those in our life together who we name here now. Louise, 
Garland Whelan. Marcia Brophy. Warren Muchmore. Janice Plourd. Stanley Whitney. James Pope. Richard Pruitt. Ken Schneier. Marion Rate. Cynthia Zabrowski. Terry Adams. Carlos Matos. Jesse Sherrill. And now, O oh God, hear us as we join saints through the ages in every time and place, those who rest from their labors and those who beside us labor on. In every time and place, we claim our way in this world by confessing who God is and naming who we are, praying as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We do invite you to put a mask on if you are going to come forward to light a candle.
come now to the time in our worship when we are invited to respond. To respond with a financial offering, a recommitment of our lives, a remembrance of those who have gone before us. If you would like to leave a gift for the church, we invite you to place your offering in the plates that are in the back as you leave. And for those of you who are worshiping online, we invite you to make a safe and secure gift on our website. But also take this time to remember how we are preparing the way for those who will come after us by honoring the gifts of those who have come before us. Let us worship God with our tithes, our offerings, our memories, and all that we are. Let us bless our gifts together. Generous God, take our gifts and promises of gathering and gratitude this day and use them so that we may be part of your great reconciling work in this world. Strengthen us, multiply what we offer so that we might grow together each day into a more powerful voice for justice and peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 637, For All the Saints. I do invite you to stand as we sing this.
And now, Holy One, go with us, wherever you may lead us. Guide us through the wilderness, protect us from the storm, bring us home rejoicing at the wonders you have shown us. Bring us home rejoicing once again unto our doors. Amen.